chapter nineteen part two of the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe chapter nineteen little fred the canal boy part two months afterwards a cold december day found fred turned loose in the streets of cincinnati since his mother's death he had driven on the canal boat but now the boat was to lie by for winter and the hands of course turned loose to find employment till spring fred was told that he must look up a place everybody was busy about their own affairs and he must shift for himself and so with half his wages in his pocket and promises for the rest he started to seek his fortune it was a cold cheerless grey-eyed day with an air that pinched fingers and toes and seemed to penetrate one's clothes like snow-water such a day as it needs the brightest fire and the happiest heart to get along at all with and unluckily fred had neither christmas was approaching and all the shops had put on their holiday dresses the confectioners windows were glittering with sparkling pyramids of candy with frosted cake and unfading fruits and flowers of the very best of sugar there too was santa claus large as life with queer wrinkled visage and back bowed with the weight of all desirable knick-knacks going down chimney in sight of all the children of cincinnati who gathered around the shop with constantly renewed acclamations on all sides might be seen the little people thronging gazing chattering while anxious papas and mammas in the shops were gravely discussing tin trumpets dolls spades wheelbarrows and toy wagons fred never had heard of the man who said how sad a thing it is to look into happiness through another man's eyes but he felt something very like it as he moved through the gay and bustling streets where everybody seemed to be finding what they wanted but himself he had determined to keep up a stout heart but in spite of himself all this bustling show and merriment made him feel sadder and sadder and lonelier and lonelier he knocked and rang at door after door but nobody wanted a boy nobody ever does want a boy when a boy is wanting a place he got tired of ringing door-bells and tried some of the shops no they didn't want him one said if he was bigger he might do another wanted to know if he could keep accounts one thought that the man around the corner wanted a boy and when fred got there he had just engaged one weary disappointed and discouraged he sat down by the iron railing that fenced a showy house and thought what he should do it was almost five in the afternoon cold dismal leaden grey was the sky the darkness already coming on fred sat listlessly watching the great snow feathers as they slowly sailed down from the sky now he heard gay laughs as groups of merry children passed and then he started as he saw some woman in a black bonnet and thought she looked like his mother but all passed and nobody looked at him nobody wanted him nobody noticed him just then a patter of little feet was heard behind him on the flagstones and a soft baby voice said how do you do fred turned in amazement and there stood a plump rosy little creature of about two years with dimpled cheek ruby lips and long fair hair curling about her sweet face she was dressed in a blue pelisse trimmed with swan's down and her complexion was so exquisitely fair her eyes so clear and sweet that fred felt almost as if it were an angel the little thing toddled up to him and holding up before him a new wax doll all splendid in silk and lace seemed quite disposed to make his acquaintance fred thought of his lost sister and his eyes filled up with tears the little one put up one dimpled hand to wipe them away while with the other holding up before him the wax doll she said coaxingly no no kai just then the house door opened and a lady richly dressed darted out exclaiming why marry you little rogue how came you out here then stopping short and looking narrowly on fred she said somewhat sharply whose boy are you and how came you here i'm nobody's boy said fred getting up with a bitter choking in his throat 
my mother's dead i only sat down here to rest me for a while well run away from here said the lady but the little girl pressed before her mother and jabbering very earnestly in unimaginable english seemed determined to give fred her wax doll in which she evidently thought resided every possible consolation the lady felt in her pocket and found a quarter which she threw towards fred there my boy that will get you lodging and supper and to-morrow you can find some place to work i dare say and she hurried in with the little girl and shut the door it was not money that fred wanted just then and he picked up the quarter with a heavy heart the sky looked darker and the street drearier and the cold wind froze the tear on his cheeks as he walked listlessly down the street in the dismal twilight i can go back to the canal boat and find the cook he thought to himself he told me i might sleep with him to-night if i couldn't find a place and he quickened his steps with this determination just as he was passing a brightly lighted coffee-house familiar voices hailed him and fred stopped he would be glad even to see a dog he had ever met before and of course he was glad when two boys old canal boat acquaintances hailed him and invited him into the coffee-house the blazing fire was a brave light on that dismal night and the faces of the two boys were full of glee and they began rallying fred on his doleful appearance and insisting on it that he should take something warm with them fred hesitated a moment but he was tired and desperate and the steaming well-sweetened beverage was too tempting who cares for me thought he and why should i care and down went the first spirituous liquor the boy had ever tasted and in a few moments he felt a wonderful change he was no longer a timid cold disheartened heart-sick boy but felt somehow so brave so full of hope and courage that he began to swagger to laugh very loud and to boast in such high terms of the money in his pocket and of his future intentions and prospects that the two boys winked significantly at each other they proposed after sitting a while to walk out and see the shop windows all three of the boys had taken enough to put them to extra merriment but fred who was entirely unused to the stimulant was quite beside himself if they sung he shouted if they laughed he screamed and he thought within himself he never had heard and thought so many witty things as on that very evening at last they fell in with quite a press of boys who were crowding round a confectionery window and as usual in such cases there began an elbowing and scuffling contest for places in which fred was quite conspicuous at last a big boy presumed on his superior size to edge in front of our hero and cut off his prospect and fred without more ado sent him smashing through the shop window there was a general scrabble every one ran for himself and fred never having been used to the business was not very skilful in escaping and of course was caught and committed to an officer who with small ceremony carried him off and locked him up in the watch-house from which he was the next morning taken before the mayor and after examination sent to jail this sobered fred he came to himself as out of a dream and he was overwhelmed with an agony of shame and self-reproach he had broken his promise to his dead mother he had been drinking and his heart failed him when he thought of the horrors that his mother had always associated with that word and then he was in jail that place that his mother had always represented as an almost impossible horror the climax of shame and disgrace the next night the poor boy stretched himself on his hard lonely bed and laid under his head his little bundle containing his few clothes and his mother's bible and then sobbed himself to sleep cold and grey dawned the following morning on little fred as he slowly and heavily awoke and with a bitter chill of despair recalled the events of the last two nights and looked up at the iron grated window and round on the cheerless walls and as if in bitter contrast arose before him an image of his lost home the neat quiet room the white curtains and snowy floor his mother's bed with his own little cot beside it and his mother's mild blue eyes as they looked upon him only six months ago mechanically he untied the check handkerchief which contained his few clothes and worldly possessions and relics of home there was the small clean printed bible his mother had given him with so many tears on their first parting there was a lock of her soft brown hair there too were a pair of little worn shoes and stockings a baby's rattle and a curl of golden hair which he had laid up in memory of his lost little pet 
fred laid his head down over all these his forlorn treasures and sobbed as if his heart would break after a while the jailer came in and really seemed affected by the distress of the child and said what he could to console him and in the course of the day as the boy seemed to be so lonesome like he introduced another boy into the room as company for him this was a cruel mercy for while the child was alone with himself in the memories of the past he was if sad at least safe and in a few hours after this new introduction he was neither his new companion was a tall boy of fourteen with small cunning grey eyes to which a slight cast gave an additional expression of shrewdness and drollery he was a young gentleman of great natural talent in a certain line with very precocious attainments and all that kind of information which a boy gains by running at large for several years in a city's streets without anything particular to do or anybody in particular to obey any conscience any principle any fear either of god or man we should not say that he had never seen the inside of a church for he had been for various purposes into every one of the city and to every camp meeting for miles around and so much had he profited by these exercises that he could mimic to perfection every minister who had any perceptible peculiarity could caricature every species of psalm singing and give ludicrous imitations of every form of worship then he was au fait in all coffee-house lore and knew the names and qualities of every kind of beverage therein compounded and as to smoking and chewing the first elements of which he mastered when he was about six years old he was now a connoisseur in the higher branches he had been in jail dozens of times rather liked the fun had served one term on the chain gang not so bad either shouldn't mind another learned a good many prime things there at first fred seemed inclined to shrink from his new associate an instinctive feeling like the warning of an invisible angel seemed to whisper beware but he was alone with a heart full of bitter thoughts and the sight of a fellow face was some comfort then his companion was so dashing so funny so free and easy and seemed to make such a comfortable matter of being in jail that fred's heart naturally buoyant began to come up again in his breast dick jones soon drew out of him his simple history as to how he came there and finding that he was a raw hand seemed to feel bound to patronize and take him under his wing he laughed quite heartily at fred's story and soon succeeded in getting him to laugh at it too how strange the very scenes that in the morning he looked at only with bitter anguish and remorse this noon he was laughing at as good jokes so much for the influence of good society an instinctive feeling soon after dick jones came in led fred to push his little bundle into the farthest corner under the bed far out of sight or inquiry and the same reason led him to suppress all mention of his mother and all the sacred part of his former life he did this more studiously because having once accidentally remarked how his mother used to forbid him certain things the well-educated dick broke out well for my part i could whip my mother when i want higher than that with a significant gesture whip your mother exclaimed fred with a face full of horror to be sure greenie why not precious fun it was in those times i used to slip in and steal the old woman's whiskey and sugar when she was just too far over to walk a crack she'd throw the tongs at me and i'd throw the shovel at her and so it went square and square gerda says somewhere miserable is that man whose mother has not made all other mothers venerable our new acquaintance bade fair to come under this category fred's education under this talented instructor made progress he sat hours and hours laughing at his stories sometimes obscene sometimes profane but always so full of life drollery and mimicry that a more steady head than fred's was needed to withstand the contagion dick had been to the theatre knew it all like a book and would take fred there as soon as they got out then he had a first-rate pack of cards and he could teach fred to play and the gay tempters were soon spread out on their bed and fred and his instructor sat hour after hour absorbed in what to him was a new world of interest he soon learned could play for small stakes and felt in himself the first glimmering of that fire which when fully kindled many waters cannot quench nor floods drown 
dick was as we said precocious he had the cool eye and steady hand of an experienced gamester and in a few days he won of course all fred's little earnings but then he was quite liberal and free with his money he added to their prison fare such various improvements as his abundance of money enabled him to buy he had brought with him the foundation of good cheer in a capacious bottle which emerged the first night from his pocket for he said he never went to jail without his provision then hot water and sugar and lemons and peppermint drops were all forthcoming for money and fred learned once and again and again the fatal secret of hushing conscience and memory and bitter despair and delirious happiness and as dick said was getting to be a right jolly un that would make something yet and was it all gone all washed away by this sudden wave of evil every trace of prayer and hope and sacred memory in this poor child's heart no not all for many a night when his tempter slept by his side the child lived over the past again he kneeled in prayer and felt his mother's guardian hand on his head and he wept tears of bitter remorse and wondered at the dread change that had come over him then he dreamed and he saw his mother and sister walking in white fair as angels and would go to them but between him and them was a great gulf fixed which widened and widened and grew darker and darker till he could see them no more and he awoke in utter misery and despair again and again he resolved in the darkness of the night that to-morrow he would not drink and he would not speak a wicked word and he would not play cards nor laugh at dick's bad stories ah how many such midnight resolves have evil angels sneered at and good ones sighed over for with daylight back comes the old temptation and with it the old mind and with daylight came back the inexorable prison walls which held fred and his successful tempter together at last he gave himself up no he could not be good with dick there was no use in trying and he made no more midnight resolves and drank more freely of the dreadful remedy for unquiet thoughts and now is fred growing in truth a wicked boy in a little while more and he shall be such a one as you will on no account take under your roof lest he corrupt your own children and yet father mother look at your son of twelve years your bright darling boy and think of him shut up for a month with such a companion in such a cell and ask yourselves if he would be any better and was there no eye heavenly or earthly to look after this lost one was there no eye which could see through all the traces of sin the yet lingering drops of that baptism and early prayer and watchfulness which consecrated it yes he whose mercy extends to the third and fourth generations of those who love him sent a friend to our poor boy in his last distress it is one of the most refined and characteristic modifications of christianity that those who are themselves sheltered guarded fenced by good education knowledge and competence appoint and sustain a pastor and guardian in our large cities to be the shepherd of the wandering and lost and of them who in the scripture phrase have none to help justly is he called the city missionary for what is more truly missionary ground in the hospital among the old the sick the friendless the forlorn in the prison among the hardened the blaspheming among the discouraged and despairing still holding with unsteady hand on to some forlorn fragment of virtue and self-respect goes this missionary to stir the dying embers of good to warn retreat implore to adjure by sacred recollections of father mother and home the fallen wanderers to return he finds friends and places and employment for some and by timely aid and encouragement saves many a one from destruction in this friendly shape appeared a man of prayer to visit the cell in which fred was confined dick listened to his instructions with cool complacency rolling his tobacco from side to side in his mouth and meditating on him as a subject for some future histrionic exercise of his talent but his voice was as welcome to poor fred as daylight in a dungeon all the smothered remorse and despair of his heart burst forth in bitter confessions as with many tears he poured forth his story to the friendly man it needs not to prolong our story for now the day has dawned and the hour of release is come it is not needful to carry our readers through all the steps by which fred was transferred first to the fireside of the friendly missionary and afterwards to the guardian care of a good old couple who resided on a thriving farm not far from cincinnati 
set free from evil influences the first carefully planted and watered seeds of good began to grow again and he became as a son to the kind family who had adopted him End of chapter nineteen part two little fred the canal boy chapter twenty of the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe chapter twenty the canal boat of all the ways of travelling which obtain among our locomotive nation this said vehicle the canal boat is the most absolutely prosaic and inglorious there is something picturesque nay almost sublime in the lordly march of your well-built high-bred steamboat go take your stand on some overhanging bluff where the blue ohio winds its thread of silver or the sturdy mississippi tears its path through unbroken forests and it will do your heart good to see the gallant boat walking the waters with unbroken and powerful tread and like some fabled monster of the wave breathing fire and making the shores resound with its deep respirations then there is something mysterious even awful in the power of steam see it curling up against a blue sky some rosy morning graceful floating intangible and to all appearance the softest and gentlest of all spiritual things and then think that it is this fairy spirit that keeps all the world alive and hot with motion think how excellent a servant it is doing all sorts of gigantic works like the genii of old and yet if you let slip the talisman only for a moment what terrible advantage it will take of you and you will confess that steam has some claims both to the beautiful and the terrible for our own part when we are down among the machinery of a steamboat in full play we conduct ourselves very reverently for we consider it as a very serious neighbourhood and every time the steam whizzes with such red-hot determination from the escape valve we start as if some of the spirits were after us but in a canal boat there is no power no mystery no danger one cannot blow up one cannot be drowned unless by some special effort one sees clearly all there is in the case a horse a rope and a muddy strip of water and that is all did you ever try it reader if not take an imaginary trip with us just for experiment there's the boat exclaims a passenger in the omnibus as we are rolling down from the pittsburgh mansion house to the canal where exclaim a dozen of voices and forthwith a dozen heads go out of the window why down there under that bridge don't you see those lights what that little thing exclaims an inexperienced traveller dear me we can't half of us get into it we indeed says some old hand in the business i think you'll find it will hold us and a dozen more loads like us impossible say some you'll see say the initiated and as soon as you get out you do see and hear too what seems like a general breaking loose from the tower of babel amid a perfect hailstorm of trunks boxes valises carpet-bags and every describable and indescribable form of what a westerner calls plunder that's my trunk barks out a big round man that's my bandbox screams a heart-stricken old lady in terror for her immaculate sunday caps where's my little red box i had two carpet-bags and a my trunk had a scarl halloo where are you going with that portmanteau husband husband do you see after the large basket and the little hair trunk oh and the baby's little chair go below go below for mercy's sake my dear i'll see to the baggage at last the feminine part of creation perceiving that in this particular instance they gain nothing by public speaking are content to be led quietly under hatches and amusing is the look of dismay which each newcomer gives to the confined quarters that present themselves 
those who were so ignorant of the power of compression as to suppose the boat scarce large enough to contain them and theirs find with dismay a respectable colony of old ladies babies mothers big baskets and carpet-bags already established mercy on us says one after surveying the little room about ten feet long and six high where are we all to sleep to-night oh me what a sight of children says a young lady in a despairing tone po says an initiated traveller children scarce any here let's see one the woman in the corner two that child with the bread and butter three and then there's that other woman with two really it's quite moderate for a canal boat however we can't tell till they have all come all for mercy's sake you don't say there are any more coming exclaimed two or three in a breath they can't come there is not room notwithstanding the impressive utterance of this sentence the contrary is immediately demonstrated by the appearance of a very corpulent elderly lady with three well-grown daughters who come down looking about them most complacently entirely regardless of the unchristian looks of the company what a mercy it is that fat people are always good-natured after this follows an indiscriminate raining down of all shapes sizes sexes and ages men women children babies and nurses the state of feeling becomes perfectly desperate darkness gathers on all faces we shall be smothered we shall be crowded to death we can't stay here are heard faintly from one and another and yet though the boat grows no wider the walls no higher they do live and do stay there in spite of repeated protestations to the contrary truly as sam slick says there's a sight of wear in human nature but meanwhile the children grow sleepy and divers interesting little duets and trios arise from one part or another of the cabin hush johnny be a good boy says a pale nursing mamma to a great bristling white-headed phenomenon who is kicking very much at large in her lap i won't be a good boy neither responds johnny with interesting explicitness i want to go to bed and so and johnny makes up a mouth as big as a teacup and roars with good courage and his mamma asks him if he ever saw pa do so and tells him that he is mamma's dear good little boy and must not make a noise with various observations of the kind which are so strikingly efficacious in such cases meanwhile the domestic concert in other quarters proceeds with vigour mamma i'm tired bawls the child where's the baby's nightgown calls a nurse do take peter up in your lap and keep him still pray get out some biscuits to stop their mouths meanwhile sundry babies strike in conspirito as the music-books have it and execute various flourishes the disconsolate mothers sigh and look as if all was over with them and the young ladies appear extremely disgusted and wonder what business women have to be travelling round with babies to these troubles succeeds the turning out scene when the whole caravan is ejected into the gentlemen's cabin that the beds may be made the red curtains are put down and in solemn silence all the last mysterious preparations begin at length it is announced that all is ready forthwith the whole company rush back and find the walls embellished by a series of little shelves about a foot wide each furnished with a mattress and bedding and hooked to the ceiling by a very suspiciously slender cord direful are the ruminations and exclamations of inexperienced travellers particularly young ones as they eye these very equivocal accommodations what sleep up there i won't sleep on one of those top shelves i know the cords will certainly break the chambermaid here takes up the conversation and solemnly assures them that such an accident is not to be thought of at all that it is a natural impossibility a thing that could not happen without an actual miracle and since it becomes increasingly evident that thirty ladies cannot all sleep on the lowest shelf there is some effort made to exercise faith in this doctrine nevertheless all look on their neighbours with fear and trembling and when the stout lady talks of taking a shelf she is most urgently pressed to change places with her alarmed neighbour below points of location being after a while adjusted comes the last struggle everybody wants to take off a bonnet or look for a shawl to find a cloak or get a carpet-bag and all set about it with such zeal that nothing can be done ma'am you're on my foot says one will you please to move ma'am says somebody who is gasping and struggling behind you move you echo 
indeed i should be very glad to but i don't see much prospect of it chambermaid calls a lady who is struggling among a heap of carpet-bags and children at one end of the cabin ma'am echoes the poor chambermaid who is wedged fast in a similar situation at the other where's my cloak chambermaid i'd find it ma'am if i could move chambermaid my basket chambermaid my parasol chambermaid my carpet-bag mamma they push me so hush child crawl under there and lie still till i can undress you at last however the various distresses are over the babies sink to sleep and even that much enduring being the chambermaid seeks out some corner for repose tired and drowsy you are just sinking into a doze when bang goes the boat against the sides of a lock ropes scrape men run and shout and up fly the heads of all the top shelfites who are generally the more juvenile and airy part of the company what's that what's that flies from mouth to mouth and forthwith they proceed to awaken their respective relations mother aunt hannah do wake up what is this awful noise oh only a lock pray be still groan out the sleepy members from below a lock exclaim the vivacious creatures ever on the alert for information and what is a lock pray don't you know what a lock is you silly creatures do lie down and go to sleep but say there ain't any danger in a lock is there respond the queerists danger exclaims a deaf old lady poking up her head what's the matter there ain't nothing burst has there no 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 exclaim the provoked and despairing opposition party who find that there is no such thing as going to sleep till they have made the old lady below and the young ladies above understand exactly the philosophy of a lock after a while the conversation again subsides again all is still you hear only the trampling of horses and the rippling of the rope in the water and sleep again is stealing over you you doze you dream and all of a sudden you are started by a cry chambermaid wake up the lady that wants to be set ashore up jumps chambermaid and up jump the lady and two children and forthwith form a committee of inquiry as to ways and means where's my bonnet says the lady half awake and fumbling among the various articles of that name i thought i hung it up behind the door can't you find it says poor chambermaid yawning and rubbing her eyes oh yes here it is says the lady and then the cloak the shawl the gloves the shoes receive each a separate discussion at last all seems ready and they begin to move off when lo peter's cap is missing now where can it be soliloquizes the lady i put it right here by the table leg maybe it got into some of the berths at this suggestion the chambermaid takes the candle and goes round deliberately to every berth poking the light directly in the face of every sleeper here it is she exclaims pulling at something black under one pillow no indeed those are my shoes says the vexed sleeper maybe it's here she resumes darting upon something dark in another berth no that's my bag responds the occupant the chambermaid then proceeds to turn over all the children on the floor to see if it is not under them in the course of which process they are most agreeably waked up and enlivened and when everybody is broad awake and most uncharitably wishing the cap and peter too at the bottom of the canal the good lady exclaims well if this isn't lucky here i had it safe in my basket all the time and she departs amid the what shall i say execrations of the whole company ladies though they be well after this follows a hushing up and wiping up among the juvenile population and a series of remarks commences from the various shelves of a very edifying and instructive tendency one says that the woman did not seem to know where anything was another says that she has waked them all up a third adds that she has waked up all the children too and the elderly ladies make more reflections on the importance of putting your things where you can find them being always ready which observations being delivered in an exceedingly doleful and drowsy tone form a sort of sub-bass to the lively chattering of the upper shelfites who declare that they feel quite wide awake that they don't think they shall go to sleep again to-night and discourse over everything in creation until you heartily wish you were enough related to them to give them a scolding at last however voice after voice drops off you fall into a most refreshing slumber it seems to you that you sleep about a quarter of an hour when the chambermaid pulls you by the sleeve will you please to get up ma'am we want to make the beds you start and stare sure enough the night is gone so much for sleeping on board canal boats 
let us not enumerate the manifold perplexities of the morning toilet in a place where every lady realizes most forcibly the condition of the old woman who lived under a broom all she wanted was elbow-room let us not tell how one glass is made to answer for thirty fair faces one ewer and vase for thirty lavations and tell it not in gath one towel for a company let us not intimate how ladies shoes have in a night clandestinely slid into the gentleman's cabin and gentlemen's boots elbowed or rather towed their way among ladies gear nor recite the exclamations after runaway property that are heard i can't find nothing of johnny's shoe here's a shoe in the water pitcher is this it my side combs are gone exclaims a nymph with dishevelled curls massy do look at my bonnet exclaims an old lady elevating an article crushed into as many angles as there are pieces in a minced pie i never did sleep so much together in my life echoes a poor little french lady whom despair has driven into talking english but our shortening paper warns us not to prolong our catalogue of distresses beyond reasonable bounds and therefore we will close with advising all our friends who intend to try this way of travelling for pleasure to take a good stock both of patience and clean towels with them for we think that they will find abundant need for both End of chapter twenty the canal boat chapter twenty one of the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by april six zero nine zero california united states of america chapter twenty one feeling there is one way of studying human nature which surveys mankind only as a set of instruments for the accomplishment of personal plans there is another which regards them simply as a gallery of pictures to be admired or laughed at as the caricature or the beau ideal predominates the third way regards them as human beings having hearts that can suffer and enjoy that can be improved or be ruined as those who are linked to us by mysterious reciprocal influences by the common dangers of a present existence and the uncertainties of a future one as presenting wherever we meet them claims on our sympathy and assistance those who adapt the last method are interested in human beings not so much by present attractions as by their capabilities as intelligent immortal beings by a high belief of what every mind may attain in an immortal existence by anxieties for its temptations and dangers and often by the perception of errors and faults which threaten its ruin the first two modes are adopted by the great mass of society the last is the office of those few scattered stars in the sky of life who look down on its dark selfishness to remind us that there is a world of light and love to this class did he belong whose rising and settling on earth were for the healing of the nations and to this class has belonged many a pure and devoted spirit like him shining to cheer like him fading away into the heavens to this class many a one wishes to belong who has an eye to distinguish the divinity of virtue without the resolution to attain it who while they sweep along the selfish current of society still regret that society is not different that they themselves are not different if this train of thought has no very particular application to what follows it was nevertheless suggested by it and of its relevancy others must judge look into this schoolroom it is a warm sleepy afternoon in july there is scarcely air enough to stir the leaves of the tall buttonwood trees before the door or to lift the loose leaves of the copy-book in the window the sun has been diligently shining in those curtainless west windows ever since three o'clock upon those blotted and mangled desks and those decrepit and tottering benches and that great armchair the high place of authority you can faintly hear about the door the craw craw of some neighboring chickens which have stepped around to consider the dinner baskets and pick up the crumbs of the noon's repast for a marvel the busy school is still because in truth it is too warm to stir you will find nothing to disturb your meditation on character for you cannot hear 
the beat of those little hearts nor the bustle of all those busy thoughts now look around who of these is the most interesting is it that tall slender hazel-eyed boy with a glance like a falcon whose elbows rest on his book as he gazes out on the great buttonwood tree and is calculating how he shall fix his squirrel trap when school is out or is it that curly-headed little rogue who is shaking with repressed laughter at seeing a chicken roll over in a dinner basket or is it that arch boy with black eyelashes and a deep mischievous dimple in his cheeks who is slyly fixing a fish-hook to the skirts of the master's coat yet looking as abstracted as archimedes whenever the good man turns his head that way no these are intelligent bright beautiful but it is not these perhaps then it is that sleepy little girl with golden curls and a mouth like a half-blown rosebud see the small brass thimble has fallen to the floor her patchwork drops from her lap her blue eyes close like two sleepy violets her little head is nodding and she sinks on her sister's shoulder surely it is she no it is not but look in that corner do you see that boy with such a gloomy countenance so vacant yet so ill-natured he is doing nothing and he very seldom does anything he is surly and gloomy in his looks and actions he never showed any more aptitude for saying or doing a pretty thing than his straight white hair does for curling he is regularly blamed and punished every day and the more he is blamed and punished the worse he grows none of the boys and girls in school will play with him or if they do they will be sorry for it and every day the master assures him that he does not know what to do with him and that he makes him more trouble than any boy in school with similar judicious information that has a striking tendency to promote improvement that is the boy to whom i apply the title of the most interesting one he is interesting because he is not pleasing because he has bad habits because he does wrong because under present influences he is always likely to do wrong he is interesting because he has become what he is now by means of the very temperament which often makes the noblest virtue it is feeling acuteness of feeling which has given that countenance its expression that character its moroseness he has no father and that long-suffering friend his mother is gone too yet he has relations and kind ones too and in the compassionate language of worldly charity it may be said of him he would have nothing of which to complain if he would only behave himself his little sister is always bright always pleasant and cheerful and his friends say why should not he be so too he is in exactly the same circumstances no he is not in one circumstance they differ he has a mind to feel and remember everything that can pain she can feel and remember but little if you blame him he is exasperated gloomy and cannot forget if you blame her she can say she has done wrong in a moment and all is forgotten her mind can no more be wounded than the little brook where she loves to play the bright waters close again and smile and prattle as merry as before which is the most desirable temperament it would be hard to say the power of feeling is necessary for all that is noble in man and yet it involves the greatest risks they who catch at happiness on the bright surface of things secure a portion such as it is with more certainty those who dive for it in the waters of deeper feeling if they succeed will bring up pearls and diamonds but if they sink they are lost for ever but now comes saturday and school is just out can any one of my readers remember the rapturous prospect of a long bright saturday afternoon where are you going will you come and see me we are going a-fishing let us go a-strawberrying may be heard rising from the happy group but no one comes near the ill-humoured james and the little party going to visit his sister wish james was out of the way he sees every motion hears every whisper knows suspects feels it all and turns to go home more sullen and ill-tempered than common the world looks dark nobody loves him and he is told that it is all his own fault and that makes the matter still worse when the little party arrive he is suspicious and irritable and of course soon excommunicated then as he stands in disconsolate anger looking over the garden fence at the gay group making dandelion chains and playing baby house under the trees he wonders why he is not like the other children he wishes he were different and yet he does not know what to do he looks around and everything is blooming and bright his little bed of flowers is even brighter and sweeter than ever before and a new rose is just opening on his rose-bush there goes pussy too racing and scampering 
with little ellen after her in among the alleys and flowers and the birds are singing in the trees and the soft winds brush the blossoms of the sweet pea against his cheek and yet though all nature looks on him so kindly he is wretched let us now change the scene why is that crowded assembly so attentive so silent who is speaking it is our old friend the little disconsolate schoolboy but his eyes are flashing with intellect his face fervent with emotions his voice breathes like music and every mind is enchained again it is a splendid sunset and yonder enthusiast meets it face to face as a friend he is silent rapt happy he feels the poetry which god has written he is touched by it as god meant that feeling spirit should be touched again he is watching by the bed of sickness and it is blessed to have such a watcher anticipating every want relieving not in a cold uninterested way but with the quick perceptions the tenderness the gentleness of an angel follow him into the circle of friendship and why is he so loved and trusted why can you so easily tell to him what you can say to no one else besides why is it that all around him feel that he can understand appreciate be touched by all that touches them and when heaven uncloses its doors of light when all its knowledge its purity its bliss rises on the eye and passes into the soul who then will be looked on as the one who might be envied he who can or he who cannot feel End of chapter twenty one feeling chapter twenty two of the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kate fallis the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe chapter twenty two the seamstress few save the poor feel for the poor the rich know not how hard it is to be of needful food and needful rest debarred their paths are paths of plenteousness they sleep on silken down they never think how wearily the weary head lies down they never by the window sit and see the gay pass by yet take their weary work again and with a mournful eye l e l however fine and elevated in a sentimental point of view may have been the poetry of this gifted writer we think we have never seen anything from this source that ought to give a better opinion of her than the little ballad from which the above verses are taken they show that the accomplished authoress possessed not merely a knowledge of the dreamy ideal wants of human beings but the more pressing and homely ones which the fastidious and poetical are often the last to appreciate the sufferings of poverty are not confined to those of the common squalid every day inured to hardships and ready with open hand to receive charity let it come to them as it will there is another class on whom it presses with still heavier power the generous the decent the self-respecting who have struggled with their lot in silence bearing all things hoping all things and willing to endure all things rather than breathe a word of complaint or to acknowledge even to themselves that their own efforts will not be sufficient for their own necessities pause with me a while at the door of yonder room whose small window overlooks a little court below it is inhabited by a widow and her daughter dependent entirely on the labours of the needle and those other slight and precarious resources which are all that remain to woman when left to struggle her way through the world alone it contains all their small earthly store and there is scarce an article of its little stock of furniture that has not been thought of and toiled for and its price calculated over and over again before everything could be made right for its purchase 
every article is arranged with the utmost neatness and care nor is the most costly furniture of a fashionable parlour more sedulously guarded from a scratch or a rub than is that brightly varnished bureau and that neat cherry tea-table and bedstead the floor too boasted once a carpet but old time has been busy with it picking a hole here and making a thin place there and though the old fellow has been followed up by the most indefatigable zeal in darning the marks of his mischievous fingers are too plain to be mistaken it is true a kindly neighbour has given a bit of faded baize which has been neatly clipped and bound and spread down over an entirely unmanageable hole in front of the fireplace and other places have been repaired with pieces of different colours and yet after all it is evident that the poor carpet is not long for this world but the best face is put upon everything the little cupboard in the corner that contains a few china cups and one or two antiquated silver spoons relics of better days is arranged with jealous neatness and the white muslin window curtain albeit the muslin be old has been carefully whitened and starched and smoothly ironed and put up with exact precision and on the bureau covered by a snowy cloth are arranged a few books and other memorials of former times and a faded miniature which though it have little about it to interest a stranger is more precious to the poor widow than everything besides mrs ames is seated in a rocking-chair supported by a pillow and busy cutting out work while her daughter a slender sickly-looking girl is sitting by the window intent on some fine stitching mrs ames in former days was the wife of a respectable merchant and the mother of an affectionate family but evil fortune had followed her with a steadiness that seemed like the stern decree of some adverse fate rather than the ordinary dealings of a merciful providence first came a heavy run of losses in business then long and expensive sickness in the family and the death of children then there was the selling of the large house and elegant furniture to retire to a humbler style of living and finally the sale of all the property with the view of quitting the shores of a native land and commencing life again in a new one but scarcely had the exiled family found themselves in the port of a foreign land when the father was suddenly smitten down by the hand of death and his lonely grave made in a land of strangers the widow broken-hearted and discouraged had still a wearisome journey before her ere she could reach any whom she could consider as her friends with her two daughters entirely unattended and with her finances impoverished by detention and sickness she performed the tedious journey arrived at the place of her destination she found herself not only without immediate resources but considerably in debt to one who had advanced money for her travelling expenses with silent endurance she met the necessities of her situation her daughters delicately reared and hitherto carefully educated were placed out to service and mrs ames sought for employment as a nurse the younger child fell sick and the hard earnings of the mother were all exhausted in the care of her and though she recovered in part she was declared by her physician to be the victim of a disease which would never leave her till it terminated her life as soon however as her daughter was so far restored as not to need her immediate care mrs ames resumed her laborious employment scarcely had she been able in this way to discharge the debts for her journey and to furnish the small room we have described when the hand of disease was laid heavily on herself 
too resolute and persevering to give way to the first attacks of pain and weakness she still continued her fatiguing employment till her system was entirely prostrated thus all possibility of pursuing her business was cut off and nothing remained but what could be accomplished by her own and her daughter's dexterity at the needle it is at this time we ask you to look in upon the mother and daughter mrs ames is sitting up the first time for a week and even to-day she is scarcely fit to do so but she remembers that the month is coming round and her rent will soon be due and in her feebleness she will stretch every nerve to meet her engagements with punctilious exactness wearied at length with cutting out and measuring and drawing threads she leans back in her chair and her eye rests on the pale face of her daughter who has been sitting for two hours intent on her stitching ellen my child your head aches don't work so steadily oh no it don't ache much she said too conscious of looking very much tired poor girl had she remained in the situation in which she was born she would now have been skipping about and enjoying life as other young girls of fifteen do but now there is no choice of employments for her no youthful companions no visiting no pleasant walks in the fresh air evening and morning it is all the same headache or side-ache it is all one she must hold on the same unvarying task a wearisome thing for a girl of fifteen but see the door opens and mrs ames face brightens as her other daughter enters mary has become a domestic in a neighbouring family where her faithfulness and kindness of heart have caused her to be regarded more as a daughter and a sister than as a servant here mother is your rent money she exclaimed so do put up your work and rest a while i can get enough to pay it next time before the month comes around again dear child i do wish you would ever think to get anything for yourself said mrs ames i cannot consent to use up all your earnings as i have done lately and all ellen's too you must have a new dress this spring and that bonnet of yours is not decent any longer oh no mother i have made over my blue calico and you would be surprised to see how well it looks and my best frock when it is washed and darned will answer some time longer and then mrs grant has given me a ribbon and when my bonnet is whitened and trimmed it will look very well and so she added i brought you some wine this afternoon you know the doctor says you need wine dear child i want to see you take some comfort of your money yourself well i do take comfort of it mother it is more comfort to be able to help you than to wear all the finest dresses in the world two months from this dialogue found our little family still more straitened and perplexed mrs ames had been confined all the time with sickness and the greater part of ellen's time and strength was occupied with attending to her very little sewing could the poor girl now do in the broken intervals that remained to her and the wages of mary were not only used as fast as earned but she anticipated two months in advance mrs ames had been better for a day or two and had been sitting up exerting all her strength to finish a set of shirts which had been sent in to make the money for them will just pay our rent sighed she and if we can do a little more this week dear mother you are so tired said ellen do lie down and not worry any more till i come back ellen went out and passed on till she came to the door of an elegant house whose damask and muslin window-curtains indicated a fashionable residence 
mrs elmore was sitting in her splendidly furnished parlour and around her lay various fancy articles which two young girls were busily unrolling what a lovely pink scarf said one throwing it over her shoulders and skipping before a mirror while the other exclaimed do look at these pocket handkerchiefs mother what elegant lace well girls said mrs elmore these handkerchiefs are a shameful piece of extravagance i wonder you will insist on having such things la mamma everybody has such now laura seymour has half a dozen that cost more than these and her father is no richer than ours well said mrs elmore rich or not rich it seems to make very little odds we do not seem to have half as much money to spare as we did when we lived in the little house in spring street what with new furnishing the house and getting everything you boys and girls say you must have we are poorer if anything than we were then ma'am here is mrs ames girl come with some sewing said the servant show her in said mrs elmore ellen entered timidly and handed her bundle of work to mrs elmore who forthwith proceeded a minute scrutiny of the articles for she prided herself on being very particular as to her sewing but though the work had been executed by feeble hands and aching eyes even mrs elmore could detect no fault in it well it is very prettily done said she what does your mother charge ellen handed a neatly folded bill which she had drawn for her mother i must say i think your mother's prices are very high said mrs elmore examining her nearly empty purse everything is getting so dear that one hardly knows how to live ellen looked at the fancy articles and glanced around the room with an air of innocent astonishment ah said mrs elmore i dare say it seems to you as if persons in our situation had no need of economy but for my part i feel the need of it more and more every day as she spoke she handed ellen the three dollars which though it was not a quarter the price of one of the handkerchiefs was all that she and her sick mother could claim in the world there said she tell your mother i like her work very much but i do not think i can afford to employ her if i can find any one to work cheaper now mrs elmore was not a hard-hearted woman and if ellen had come as a beggar to solicit help for her sick mother mrs elmore would have fitted out a basket of provisions and sent a bottle of wine and a bundle of old clothes and all the et cetera of such occasions but the sight of a bill always aroused all the instinctive sharpness of her business-like education she never had the dawning of an idea that it was her duty to pay anybody any more than she could possibly help nay she had an indistinct notion that it was her duty as an economist to make everybody take as little as possible when she and her daughters lived in spring street to which she had alluded they used to spend the greater part of their time at home and the family sewing was commonly done among themselves but since they had moved into a large house and set up a carriage and addressed themselves to being genteel the girls found that they had altogether too much to do to attend to their own sewing much less to perform any for their father and brothers and their mother found her hands abundantly full in overlooking her large house and taking care of expensive furniture and in superintending her increased train of servants the sewing therefore was put out and mrs elmore felt it a duty to get it done the cheapest way she could nevertheless 
mrs elmore was too notable a lady and her sons and daughters were altogether too fastidious as to the make and quality of their clothing to admit the idea of its being done in any but the most complete and perfect manner mrs elmore never accused herself of want of charity for the poor but she had never considered that the best class of the poor are those who never ask charity she did not consider that by paying liberally those who were honestly and independently struggling for themselves she was really doing a greater charity than by giving indiscriminately to a dozen applicants don't you think mother she says we charge too high for this work said ellen when she returned i am sure she did not know how much work we put in those shirts she says she cannot give us any more work she must look out for somebody that will do it cheaper i do not see how it is that people who live in such houses and have so many beautiful things can feel that they cannot afford to pay for what costs us so much well child they are more apt to feel so than people who live plainer well i am sure said ellen we cannot afford to spend so much time as we have over these shirts for less money never mind my dear said the mother soothingly here is a bundle of work that another lady has sent in and if we get it done we shall have enough for our rent and something over to buy bread with it is needless to carry our readers over all the process of cutting and fitting and gathering and stitching necessary in making up six fine shirts suffice it to say that on saturday evening all but one were finished and ellen proceeded to carry them home promising to bring the remaining one on tuesday morning the lady examined the work and gave ellen the money but on tuesday when the child came with the remaining work she found her in great ill humour upon re-examining the shirts she had discovered that in some important respects they differed from directions she meant to have given and supposed she had given and accordingly she vented her displeasure on ellen why didn't you make these shirts as i told you said she sharply we did said ellen mildly mother measured by the pattern every part and cut them herself your mother must be a fool then to make such a piece of work i wish you would just take them back and alter them over and the lady proceeded with the directions of which neither ellen nor her mother till then had had any intimation unused to such language the frightened ellen took up her work and slowly walked homeward oh dear how my head does ache thought she to herself and poor mother she said this morning she was afraid another of her sick turns was coming on and we have all this work to pull out and do over see here mother said she with a disconsolate air as she entered the room mrs rudd says take out all the bosoms and rip off all the collars and fix them quite another way she says they are not like the pattern she sent but she must have forgotten for here it is look mother it is exactly as we made them well my child carry back the pattern and show her that it is so indeed mother she spoke so cross to me and looked at me so that i do not feel as if i could go back i will go for you then said the kind maria stevens who had been sitting with mrs ames while ellen was out i will take the pattern and shirts and tell her the exact truth about it i am not afraid of her maria stevens was a tailoress who rented a room on the same floor with mrs ames a cheerful resolute go-forward little body and ready always to give a helping hand to a neighbour in trouble so she took the pattern and shirts and set out on her mission but poor mrs ames though she professed to take a right view of the matter and was very earnest in showing ellen why she ought not to distress herself about it 
still felt a shivering sense of the hardness and unkindness of the world coming over her the bitter tears would spring to her eyes in spite of every effort to suppress them as she sat mournfully gazing on the little faded miniature before mentioned when he was alive i never knew what poverty or trouble was was the thought that often passed through her mind and how many a poor forlorn one has thought the same poor mrs ames was confined to her bed for most of that week the doctor gave absolute directions that she should do nothing and keep entirely quiet a direction very sensible indeed in the chamber of ease and competence but hard to be observed in poverty and want what pains the kind and dutiful ellen took that week to make her mother feel easy how often she replied to her anxious questions that she was quite well or that her head did not ache much and by various other evasive expedients the child tried to persuade herself that she was speaking the truth and during the times her mother slept in the day or evening she accomplished one or two pieces of plain work with the price of which she expected to surprise her mother it was towards evening when ellen took her finished work to the elegant dwelling of mrs page i shall get a dollar for this said she enough to pay for mother's wine and medicine this work is done very neatly said mrs page and here is some more i should like to have finished in the same way ellen looked up wistfully hoping mrs page was going to pay her for the last work but mrs page was only searching a drawer for a pattern which she put into ellen's hands and after explaining how she wanted her work done dismissed her without saying a word about the expected dollar poor ellen tried two or three times as she was going out to turn round and ask for it but before she could decide what to say she found herself in the street mrs page was an amiable kind-hearted woman but one who was so used to large sums of money that she did not realize how great an affair a single dollar might seem to other persons for this reason when ellen had worked incessantly at the new work put into her hands that she might get the money for all together she again disappointed her in the payment i'll send the money round to-morrow said she when ellen at last found courage to ask for it but to-morrow came and ellen was forgotten and it was not till after one or two applications more that the small sum was paid but these sketches are already long enough and let us hasten to close them mrs ames found liberal friends who could appreciate and honour her integrity of principle and loveliness of character and by their assistance she was raised to see more prosperous days and she and the delicate ellen and warm-hearted mary were enabled to have a home and fireside of their own and to enjoy something like the return of their former prosperity we have given these sketches drawn from real life because we think there is in general too little consideration on the part of those who give employment to those in situations like the widow here described the giving of employment is a very important branch of charity inasmuch as it assists that class of the poor who are the most deserving it should be looked on in this light and the arrangements of a family be so made that a suitable compensation can be given and prompt and cheerful payment be made without the dread of transgressing the rules of economy it is better to teach our daughters to do without expensive ornaments or fashionable elegances better even to deny ourselves the pleasure of large donations or direct subscriptions to public charities rather than to curtail the small stipend of her whose candle goeth not out by night and who labours with her needle for herself and the helpless dear ones dependent on her exertions 
End of chapter 22「Of the May Flower and Miscellaneous Writings by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Follis. The May Flower and Miscellaneous Writings by Harriet Beecher Stowe chapter twenty three old father morris a sketch from nature of all the marvels that astonished my childhood there is none i remember to this day with so much interest as the old man whose name forms my caption when i knew him he was an aged clergyman settled over an obscure village in new england he had enjoyed the advantages of a liberal education had a strong original power of thought an omnipotent imagination and much general information but so early and so deeply had the habits and associations of the plough the farm and country life wrought themselves into his mind that his after acquirements could only mingle with them forming an unexampled amalgam like unto nothing but itself he was an ingrained new englander and whatever might have been the source of his information it came out in yankee form with the strong provinciality of yankee dialect it is in vain to attempt to give a full picture of such a genuine unique but some slight and imperfect dashes may help the imagination to a faint idea of what none can fully conceive but those who have seen and heard old father morris suppose yourself one of half a dozen children and you hear the cry father morris is coming you run to the window or door and you see a tall bulky old man with a pair of saddle-bags on one arm hitching his old horse with a fumbling carefulness and then deliberately stumping towards the house you notice his tranquil florid full moon face enlightened by a pair of great round blue eyes that roll with dreamy inattentiveness on all the objects around and as he takes off his hat you see the white curling wig that sets off his round head he comes towards you and as you stand staring with all the children around he deliberately puts his great hand on your head and with deep rumbling voice inquires how d'ye do my daughter is your daddy at home my daughter usually makes off as fast as possible in an unconquerable giggle father morris goes into the house and we watch him at every turn as with the most liberal simplicity he makes himself at home takes off his wig wipes down his great face with a checked pocket handkerchief helps himself hither and thither to whatever he wants and asks for such things as he cannot lay his hands on with all the comfortable easiness of childhood i remember to this day how he used to peep through the crack of the door or hold it half ajar and peer in to watch his motions and how mightily diverted we were with his deep slow manner of speaking his heavy cumbrous walk but above all with the wonderful faculty of hemming which he possessed his deep thundering protracted ahem was like of nothing else that ever i heard and when once as he was in the midst of one of these performances the parlour door suddenly happened to swing open i heard one of my roguish brothers calling in a suppressed tone charles charles father morris has hemmed the door open and then followed the signs of a long and desperate titter in which i sincerely sympathised but the morrow is sunday 
the old man rises in the pulpit he is not now in his own humble little parish preaching simply to the hoers of corn and planters of potatoes but there sits governor d and there is judge r and counsellor p and judge g in short he is before a refined and literary audience but father morris rises he thinks nothing of this he cares nothing he knows nothing as he himself would say but jesus christ and him crucified he takes a passage of scripture to explain perhaps it is the walk to emmaus and the conversation of jesus with his disciples immediately the whole start out before you living and picturesque the road to emmaus is a new england turnpike you can see its milestones its mullein stalks its toll gates next the disciples rise and you have before you all their anguish and hesitation and dismay talked out to you in the language of your own fireside you smile you are amused yet you are touched and the illusion grows every moment you see the approaching stranger and the mysterious conversation grows more and more interesting emmaus rises in the distance in the likeness of a new england village with a white meeting-house and spire you follow the travellers you enter the house with them nor do you wake from your trance until with streaming eyes the preacher tells you that they saw it was the lord jesus and what a pity it was they could not have known it before it was after a sermon on this very chapter of scripture history that governor griswold in passing out of the house laid hold on the sleeve of his first acquaintance pray tell me said he who is this minister why it is old father morris well he is an oddity and a genius too i declare he continued i have been wondering all the morning how i could have read the bible to so little purpose as not to see all these particulars he has presented i once heard him narrate in this picturesque way the story of lazarus the great bustling city of jerusalem first rises to view and you are told with great simplicity how the lord jesus used to get tired of the noise and how he was tired of preaching again and again to people who would not mind a word he said and how when it came evening he used to go out and see his friends in bethany then he told about the house of martha and mary a little white house among the trees he said you could just see it from jerusalem and there the lord jesus and his disciples used to go and sit in the evenings with martha and mary and lazarus then the narrator went on to tell how lazarus died describing with tears and a choking voice the distress they were in and how they sent a message to the lord jesus and he did not come and how they wondered and wondered and thus on he went winding up the interest by the graphic minutiae of an eye-witness till he woke you from the dream by his triumphant joy at the resurrection scene on another occasion as he was sitting at a tea-table unusually supplied with cakes and sweetmeats he found an opportunity to make a practical allusion to the same family story he said that mary was quiet and humble sitting at her saviour's feet to hear his words but martha thought more of what was to be got for tea martha could not find time to listen to christ no she was cumbered with much serving around the house frying fritters and making gingerbread among his own simple people his style of scripture painting was listened to with breathless interest but it was particularly in those rustic circles 
called conference meetings that his whole warm soul unfolded and the bible in his hands became a gallery of new england paintings he particularly loved the evangelists following the footsteps of jesus christ dwelling upon his words repeating over and over again the stories of what he did with all the fond veneration of an old and favoured servant sometimes too he would give the narration an exceedingly practical turn as one example will illustrate he had noticed a falling off in his little circle that met for social prayer and took occasion the first time he collected a tolerable audience to tell concerning the conference meeting that the disciples attended after the resurrection but thomas was not with them thomas not with them said the old man in a sorrowful voice why what could keep thomas away perhaps said he glancing at some of his backward auditors thomas had got cold-hearted and was afraid they would ask him to make the first prayer or perhaps said he looking at some of the farmers thomas was afraid the roads were bad or perhaps he added after a pause thomas had got proud and thought he could not come in his old clothes thus he went on significantly summing up the common excuses of his people and then with great simplicity and emotion he added but only think what thomas lost for in the middle of the meeting the lord jesus came and stood among them how sorry thomas must have been this representation served to fill the vacant seats for some time to come at another time father morris gave the details of the anointing of david to be king he told them how samuel went to bethlehem to jesse's house and went in with a how d'ye do jesse and how when jesse asked him to take a chair he said he could not stay a minute that the lord had sent him to anoint one of his sons for a king and how when jesse called in the tallest and handsomest samuel said he would not do and how all the rest passed the same test and at last how samuel says why have not you any more sons jesse and jesse says why yes there is little david down in the lot and how as soon as ever samuel saw david he slashed the oil right on to him and how jesse said he never was so beaten all his life father morris sometimes used his illustrative talent to very good purpose in the way of rebuke he had on his farm a fine orchard of peaches from which some of the ten and twelve year old gentlemen helped themselves more liberally than even the old man's kindness thought expedient accordingly he took occasion to introduce into his sermon one sunday in his little parish an account of a journey he took and how he was very warm and very dry and how he saw a fine orchard of peaches that made his mouth water to look at them so says he i came up to the fence and looked all around for i would not have touched one of them without leave for all the world at last i spied a man and says i mister won't you give me some of your peaches so the man came and gave me nigh about a hatful and while i stood there eating i said mister how do you manage to keep your peaches keep them said he and he stared at me what do you mean yes sir said i don't the boys steal them boys steal them said he no indeed why sir said i i have a whole lot full of peaches and i cannot get half of them here the old man's voice grew tremulous because the boys in my parish steal them so why sir said he don't their parents teach them not to steal 
and i grew all over in a cold sweat and i told him i was afeard they didn't why how you talk says the man do tell me where you live then said father morris the tears running over i was obliged to tell him i lived in the town of g after this father morris kept his peaches our old friend was not less original in the logical than in the illustrative portions of his discourses his logic was of that familiar colloquial kind which shakes hands with common sense like an old friend sometimes too his great mind and great heart would be poured out on the vast themes of religion in language which though homely produced all the effects of the sublime he once preached a discourse on the text the high and holy one that inhabiteth eternity and from the beginning to the end it was a train of lofty and solemn thought with his usual simple earnestness and his great rolling voice he told about the great god the great jehovah and how the people in this world were flustering and worrying and afraid they should not get time to do this and that and other but he added with full-hearted satisfaction the lord is never in a hurry he has it all to do but he has time enough for he inhabiteth eternity and the grand idea of infinite leisure and almighty resources was carried through the sermon with equal strength and simplicity although the old man never seemed to be sensible of anything tending to the ludicrous in his own mode of expressing himself yet he had considerable relish for humour and some shrewdness of repartee one time as he was walking through a neighbouring parish famous for its profanity he was stopped by a whole flock of the youthful reprobates of the place father morris father morris the devil's dead is he said the old man benignly laying his hand on the head of the nearest urchin you poor fatherless children but the sayings and doings of this good old man as reported in the legends of the neighbourhood are more than can be gathered or reported he lived far beyond the common age of man and continued when age had impaired his powers to tell over and over again the same bible stories that he had told so often before i recollect hearing of the joy that almost broke the old man's heart when after many years diligent watching and nurture of the good seed in his parish it began to spring into vegetation sudden and beautiful as that which answers the patient watching of the husbandman many a hard worldly-hearted man many a sleepy inattentive hearer many a listless idle young person began to give ear to words that had long fallen unheeded a neighbouring minister who had been sent for to see and rejoice in these results describes the scene when on entering the little church he found an anxious crowded auditory assembled around their venerable teacher waiting for direction and instruction the old man was sitting in his pulpit almost choking with fullness of emotion as he gazed around father said the youthful minister i suppose you are ready to say with old simeon now lord lettest thou thy servant depart in peace for my eyes have seen thy salvation sartine sartine said the old man while the tears streamed down his cheeks and his whole frame shook with emotion it was not many years after that this simple and loving servant of christ was gathered in peace unto him whom he loved his name is fast passing from remembrance and in a few years his memory 
like his humble grave will be entirely grown over and forgotten among men though it will be had in everlasting remembrance by him who forgetteth not his servants and in whose sight the death of his saints is precious End of chapter 23